course it exists. It's at the right hand of the Father. He entered in by his own blood, the Bible says. Not by his life, nor by his death, but by his blood. The real blood of Christ. Turn to Acts chapter 16. And verse number 31. Acts chapter 16. We'll start reading verse number 30 to get the context here. Acts chapter 16, verse 30. And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Father, I pray that you'd bless your holy word as it goes forth from the mouth of this messenger. And I pray, Father, that you'd speak into the hearts of the people and glorify thyself with what you want to do in this house today and what you'll do with us later and what you're doing over the Internet right now. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. I'm going to approach the message today in a little different light. All you're aware of question and answer session. We ask the question, and then we need to come up with an answer. And so this brother here, once he became a brother, he asked this question. He said, sirs... What must I do to be saved? Now, the sad thing is that if you ask uh, different churches or religions, uh, they'll come up with different answers. So the Bible tells us, and this is what I'm going to deal with this morning. What does the Bible say? It says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. The word believe is translated from the Greek word pistuo. Now, pistuo means to put your faith in or confidence in. In plain words, it means to trust God. That's not an easy thing to do. Believe me, it's easy to say the word, but it's a matter altogether different to trust him. But this is what salvation is about. It's about putting your trust in him. It's not about assenting or agreeing with the facts about Christ. It's not about a catechism. It's not about a baptism. It's not about how you live or what a good life you live. It is whether or not you put your trust in in the Lord Jesus Christ, because that's what the word means, and that's its basic meaning. It has to do with what you do. You put your trust in it. I love Shakespeare, read Shakespeare, but I don't trust Shakespeare. I don't put my faith in what Shakespeare says, but I read this Bible, and I trust the one who wrote it, and I trust the one who offered himself to me, and if he said, any man that comes unto me, I will in no wise cast him out, that's putting my trust in him. Now, here's the question. How do I know I have really put my trust in Christ? That's a good question. That's a fair, honest question. How do I know that I have really put my trust in Christ? Answer, you will have the Holy Ghost move into you. In Romans chapter number 8 and verse number 9, the scripture says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Dwelling has to do with moving from one location to another and taking up residence. He dwells in you. So how do you know that you have the Holy Ghost move into you? How do you know that? Because this is what the Bible says in Romans chapter number 8 verse number 5. So how do I know that the Holy Ghost has moved into me? Let me give you some answers. In the book of Ephesians chapter number 6, and verse number 24, you're going to read these words. Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. When the, when the Holy Ghost moves into you, if he's the real Holy Spirit, not just the spirit of religion or of good works or of, of a humanism, you're going to love the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That is proof positive if you have a real love for the Son of God. How do I know I love him? Of course you know. You can continue on with these questions. Let me tell you how you know you love him. You want him to be preeminent in your life. You think about him all day long. You pray to him because he's your savior. You love him because he first loved you. You're not interested in somebody bragging about you if they're bragging about Jesus. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ becomes the object of your life. He's the one you're living for. You love him. You talk about him. He inspires you. And when someone denigrates his name, runs him down, it, it, it hurts. 
because you love him. And when somebody does that to the one you love, it's going to affect you. So that is one of the signs that the Holy Spirit has moved into your heart. In the book of Romans chapter number 7 and verse number 15, here's another sign that the Holy Ghost has moved into your soul. Romans chapter number 7 and verse number 15. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I. But what I hate, that do I. You hate sin. You hate the old man you used to be. You hate the places you used to go to. You hate what you used to be. And I'm talking about real hatred. I'm not talking about indifference. I'm talking about absolute hatred for sin as you see it to develop about you in this culture and the remnants of it in your life. You go to war against what used to be, what you used to be. <coughs> you hate it with all the hate that you could possibly muster. Hating sin will not get you saved. Hating the way someone else lives will not save you. Hate does not save you. If the hate is directed in the right direction and you love the Lord Jesus Christ, it's an evident sign you know him. Amen. In the book of Romans chapter number 7 and verse number 22, how you will, when, how do I know the Holy Ghost has moved in? Because you will want to read the Bible. The apostle said, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. If the Holy Spirit moves into your heart, he will lead you to the author of that book. God Almighty. That book is a love letter to you. Written on a level that you can understand. Written on a spiritual level that you can receive. If you are born of the Spirit of God, the Bible will take on a completely new meaning. It is a book that comes alive and is no longer the enigma wrapped up in a riddle that you can no longer, that you can't understand. And I'm afraid that the world tries to approach the Bible on an intellectual level as if they can break it down like a science book, a math book, and they can open up the secrets and mysteries of that spirit being simply with their mind and it won't work. But once you have been born of the spirit of the living God, God will raise you to a spiritual level where you can begin to understand the spirit of God speaking to your heart and you begin to receive that because you love his word. There's nothing like this Bible on the face of this earth. Amen. Nothing like it. Nothing like it. Num there's something else that you will seek if you've been born of the Spirit of God. 1 Peter chapter number 1 and verse number 22. Here's what it says. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned, unfeigned love of the brethren... If you have the Holy Ghost move into your soul from the new birth, you will love the people of God. And you will have a discernment of the people of God. I'm not talking about religious people. Church is full of religious people. I'm talking about a brother or a sister in Christ. You'll love them. You will have a love for them. And you'll have a love for his people in a collective body. You'll have a love for his church. You'll have a love to come together and worship God because you have a fellowship with each other that is born of the Spirit of God and there is no substitute for it. If you hate church, hate preaching, hate all of this, and yet you say, I love Jesus, I wonder what you're talking about because he said, upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The Greek word translated church is ecclesia. That word simply means a called out assembly. In one place, it's a drunken mob in the street because they're called out, out. But in most of the use in the New Testament, it is the body of Christ called out, separate unto the Lord. You will separate yourself from this ungodly generation. If you truly have the Spirit of God living in you, you will want to come on Sunday and worship with God's people. Amen. Say, I've been hurt, preacher. Well, get over it. <laughs> Say, I'm mad. Get over that too. Come to the house of God and get in here and get on your face and let God clean you up and then sit down there and worship God with God's people. Amen. 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 It's time to quit licking your wounds and begging 
throw in your, throw in your rattler, kick the slats out of your, cra your cradle and throw your rattler out in the hallway. It's time to grow up and start serving God. Amen. Amen. Because <laughs> we all got problems. You, you say, well, woe is me. Well, woe is me too. <laughs> We've all been woeing at one time or another. <laughs> That's just part of living. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter number 7 and verse number 11. Here is something else that's going to happen to you if the Spirit of God really moves into your soul. And this is where I'm going to park for a little while. Second Corinthians chapter, chapter 7 and verse 11. For behold, this selfsame thing that you sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire. Yea, what zeal. Yea, what revenge. In all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. What matter? What got all this started? Look at verse 8. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 8. For though I made you sorry with a letter... The apostle wasn't even there. He just wrote him a letter. And when the church at Corinth received the letter from the apostle Paul, it brought a revival. That's something. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm all for it. He wrote him a letter and it began to move in their midst. And these words, I'm going to break them down for you because each one of them has a distinct meaning that the apostle Paul gave us from the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number, 2 Corinthians chapter number 7 and verse number 11. But before I do, let me mention this. When God saved your soul at that very moment, he began, he started what we call a work of sanctification in your heart. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1 and verse number 2. In 1 Corinthians 1, 2, the apostle Paul says this. And this is important to understand the principle, the progression 1 Corinthians chapter number 1 and verse number 2. Unto the church of God which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. So what is sanctification? Is that salvation? No. That's a work that takes place after salvation. Sanctification is what begins to pull you apart and unto him. It has a twofold aspect to come out but draw you to Christ. Sanctification is a work that takes place in the believer's life. And it is a continuing progressive work that will last all your lifetime. It will never come to an end until you draw your last breath on this earth. But if you were saved 75 years ago. And God's been sanctifying you for 75 years. You are no more saved now than you were the very moment you accepted Christ. Sanctification does not make you more saved. Sanctification makes you more like Christ. Until Christ be formed in you. And until the day come, when God comes to get you, there's no more you. <laughs> it's all the Lord Jesus. That's who you're consumed with. Amen. That's what you're about. You're about Christ. That's sanctification. Now I'm going to talk about repentance. Because the word here in the book of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter number 7, is broken down in all of its meaning and all of its elements. And this is what's so important about this. Because it too shows you a progression in repentance. And that's a wonderful thing to see. Now we live in a generation today where it's all intellectual. It's all just, you know, I mean, I'm in control. That's the idea. I control my relationship with God. I control what I believe. I control this. I control that. I control my salvation. It's all personal control. Why? Because it is narcissism being displayed before your very face. It is no longer people humbling themselves before God. It is no longer saying, Lord, you're the Lord. And I'm one of your servants. No, I'm Lord. 
That's what we get from people today. I am the master of my destiny. Don't you hear that all the time? I am the one who pulls the strings about what happens to me and where I go and who I am until they got a letter. Now the church at Corinth had a problem. There are many at the church at Corinth that doubted the credentials of the apostle Paul. They did not believe he was a true apostle. There were those who were puffed up. They were proud. They were arrogant. They went around boasting and bragging. We had a group there, a group there at Corinth who were followers of men. I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. I'm of Cephas. I'm of Christ. And the apostle rebuked them for that. At the church at Corinth, they had a problem with one who had his father's wife. And he was fornicating. I don't know if it's his mother or stepmother. But he was fornicating. And instead of being, instead of weeping... And crying and, and praying over such a heinous thing, they were puffed up. They were proud that they weren't doing that, so they had their own little cliques. There is no more clicky church in the New Testament than the church at Corinth. Shot full of sectarianism, cliques, and that's what we have at Corinth. So the apostle Paul wrote him a letter. And when he wrote him that letter, he began to spell out to them what their problem was. Now he said, when I come into your midst, I'm base among you. And when you see me, I don't appear to you like Apollos, who was very eloquent. We read about him in the book of Acts this morning, chapter 19. He was. Apollos was eloquent. He could stand tall, speak well. He commanded attention. The apostle Paul was not like that. His voice was not like that. His appearance was not like that. But he was an apostle of God. He was anointed of God. And he said, the signs of an apostle were wrought by me in your midst. So he writes them a letter and he goes to the heart of the problem. And when he wrote them that letter and brought out the problems, here's what they did. Now I'm going to take the Greek words that are translated into English and I'm going to give you the meaning of every one of them. First of all, he said, what carefulness it wrought in you. 2 Corinthians chapter number 7 verse 11. What carefulness it wrought in you. The Greek word is spude. And it means speed. Quick to take action. When you got the letter, you awakened. It is the awakening of the sinner that starts it all, right? It is that day that you awakened and you looked at yourself and you said, hold on. I don't care what, everybody said, what everybody's doing. What about me? Who am I? Where do I stand with God? And you awaken. Yeah, an epiphany, an awakening. That's the first step of getting right with God. Awakening to your true condition. Awaken to who you really are, not who you think you are, who people say you are, all your accomplishments, who you really are. And there's only one that can tell you who you really are. Not me. Him. Notice the next thing he said in 2 Corinthians chapter number 7. He said, Behold for the selfsame thing ye saw it after a godly sort. What carefulness, what awakening it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. That's a remarkable thing. The Greek word apologia. And you know what an apology is, don't you? It came straight from Greek. Apology came from apologia. What does it really mean? It means a clearing confession the soul begins to open up flowing from the lips of that individual that has been awakened now they're no longer hiding behind a facade of religion or hiding behind people but they have awakened and now something begins to come out from the inside of them they're confessing they're giving forth from their heart and boy does it ever flow this is repentance we're talking about this morning this is how repentance works it gets you out of the intellectual salvation and gets you into the heart faith. And all oh, how the heart can change your life. You can think you're one thing one day and think you're something else. The next day your mind's nothing. But when that heart begins to awaken, that heart is who you really think, how you really think and what you... The Bible says here that he said what clearing. Now they begin to confess. It gets very, very uncomfortable. I can imagine being sitting in a crowd at the church at Corinth and they have a little group together and they've been doing some praying and the people are starting to wake up and now they're starting to confess. And my goodness, it can get real touchy. Yeah. I mean, here's one who said, well, I have to tell this, but God won't let me leave until I tell this. I've been having an affair with your wife. <laughs> oh boy. And she, of course, is sitting there and, 
And now we've got this guy confessing and she falls on her face and says, it's true, we have been having an affair. And they get down on their knees and they get right with God. She provoked by him, him provoked by the Holy Ghost. And you know what? I believe we'd have the biggest revival this country ever saw if the fornicators got right. Just them. I'm not talking about the liars and thieves. I'm talking about fornicators. <laughs> I mean, if we had the liars and thieves get, get right with God, we'd have a real revival, wouldn't we? Amen. Amen. You see what's happening in Hollywood right now, don't you? This one's having accusations against him. This one's confessing. This woman's come out. This one's come out. And this one, this one. And they tell us now that the actors are walking very softly out there in Hollywood. <laughs> Many of them are walking very softly because they're afraid they may be the next one. It was something they did 20, 30, 40 years ago. Confession they say is good for the soul if you have really had Christ move into your heart you will be brought back to what you lived in the past and all of the ugliness of it is going to rise up inside you and you're going to confess it now you don't have to get up let me give you a word of warning <laughs> I saw some of you moving in your seat you're getting ready to come down here and we got some sweat going on in here today. <laughs> no, you, you don't have to get up and come down here and say, well, now, come here. <laughs> you know what we've been doing? No, but you need to do it with God and not man. Amen. Do it with God. Do it with God. The deep things, the things that eat you up, the stuff in your life, get in your closet, shut the door, and tell it to the one that can forgive you. You see, folks, that clearing of your soul is the progress of forgiveness. Bring it out, get it forgiven. Bring it out, get it forgiven. Don't cover it up. Don't hide behind it. Don't hide it. Don't explain it away. Confess it. If you confess your faults, your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you. Some of you have never got that point in your walk with God. You, you got saved, but you, you're afraid for the Holy Ghost to really draw you close enough to God to open you up like a can and confess it. He died for it. Every dirty thing you ever did in your life, the Lord Jesus paid for it at the cross. His blood will cleanse it away. And he doesn't want you hiding behind it and hiding it and sweeping it under the rug. He wants you to confess it. So the clearing and confession. Now here's the third word he used. This same saying, this, this self same thing, as you saw it after God, it's what carefulness is wrought in you, what clearing of yourself. Now watch this. Yea, what indignation. Aganakthasis. Aganakthasis means anger. Now we've progressed to the point we're awakened. We're confessing. We're starting to get clean. And now we're beginning to see clearly like we'd never seen before. And we're starting to get some convictions. Anger. Indignation is translated. Anger. What at? You're not mad at God. You're mad at what the devil has done to you and what he's doing to people around you. And you hate to see young people go down the same road you went down. You think people ever learn. I mean, you get out, you drive these cars on the road. You ever notice that? That, 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 that a possum has a hard time getting across the road? You know, these evolutionists, I'd like to ask an evolutionist sometime, how, how long does it take them to learn? How long does it take them to evolve to where they hold up when the car's going by before they come across? Because it sure ain't happened in my lifetime. <laughs> They're just not learning, are they? No. <laughs> I'd like to think we're in a little higher order than a possum, wouldn't you? I'd like to think we're learning a little quicker, wouldn't you? Have you learned? <laughs> Have you learned anything with your walk with God? Yeah. How many of you know what it is to get burned? You know what it is to get cut? You know what it is to get bruised? You know what a breaking of bones like? Have you learned that? Have you learned the consequences of sin? Yeah. Anger. Anger at what you used to be. Anger at what Satan's doing inside your soul. Repentance is a pretty complicated thing. And it's directed toward a man and not a dog. A man. Why? Because a man's capable of answering to it. Why? Because a man's made in the image of God. Why? Because God expects a whole lot more out of you than a chicken. 
or a raccoon. God gave you a much higher life form than them. And with that great privilege and life that he gave you, he expects a return. You're accountable when they're not. So indignation. Notice the next one shows up. Fear. That's from the Greek word phobos. We get the word phobia. Fear. Fear. Wait a minute. I'm awakened. I begin to clear, confess. My soul is starting to feel clean. How many know what that feels like? Soul feels clean. Nothing between me and the Lord. Clean. Not that I'm good. I'm just clean. And then anger wells up inside the soul. Then what does that do? It produces fear. Fear. What are you afraid of? Fear of man bringeth a snare. Afraid of the devil? No. That one. A good, healthy fear of God makes you healthy spiritually. You don't have a fear of God. I wonder what kind of a spiritual life you really have. You mean we should fear God? You get a hold of who he is, you will. I challenge you to walk out tonight when it's dark, if there's no clouds in the sky, and look up at those stars and read what the Bible says. He made the stars also. And yet they don't know how far it is from here to the end of there. They don't know whether from here to the end of there is in a closed system or if it's simply some kind of a dimensional thing that we don't even understand the concept. We have no idea what's going on up there. But I do know this. He upholdeth all things by the word of his power. I fear him. I do. I fear him because I... He gives me a sense of his greatness and my littleness. I'm just a little speck on a speck in a huge creation. Oh boy, fear. <laughs> then what does that produce? A vehement desire. A pip up, a pipa thesis. What's that mean? A longing for. Your loves begin to change. Your desires take on a new life. You become heavenly minded. You begin to look up into the heavens and you try to find that third heaven where your father dwells with the son at his right hand. You think about heaven. There's a longing. I know whom I have believed. I'm persuaded he's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. I know where I'm going if I leave this day and it's my last day on earth. If it is, I've preached my last message. I love you. I've tried to tell you the truth. I've tried to live before you the way God would have me live. But if this is my last message to you, goodbye. I'll see you by the river. I'll meet you by the river. I know whom I have believed. I know where I'm going. That's my home. The apostle said, I have a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far greater. Hallelujah. Then it says zeal. Zelos. This is one of those Greek words that has no English counterpart. So you say zealous. So what does that word mean? Akin to jealousy. Belonging to the Lord. I'm the bride of Christ. I'm jealous for him. him he's my father. Is he your father? Yeah. Well, I'm glad he is. He's my father. <laughs> he's your father? Good. But he's my father. Are you following me? He's my Lord and my master and my God. I'm jealous of him. So what kind of jealousy is it? Same kind of jealousy. Somebody down went back on the back row, sat down next to my sweetheart, put his arm around her shoulder. How do you think I'd react to that? <laughs> what if somebody came in and sat down next to your bride? I mean, would you, uh, you'd be all hunky-dory, huh? Would it? No, I don't think you'd like that. I think you'd get a little uncomfortable with that, right? Why? Because she is yours and you are hers. He is mine and I am his. This repentance is beginning to work a relationship now. It's cleaned you out. It's wakened you up. It's given you the anger you need. And now it's beginning to build a relationship. Didn't know repentance had so much in it. And then the last word he uses is revenge. Ekdikasis. Ekdikasis. What does that word mean? It means to restore. Retribution. Restore, restoration. In other words, it gives you a real purpose in life. 
If you've really repented and you understand that all the nuances of what I'm talking about, the final product is, I know why I'm here. You don't have to tell me why I'm here. For to me to live is Christ. I don't need anybody to write a book and tell me what my purpose in life is about. I know what my purpose is. My purpose is to live for him. Love him. Adore him. Exalt him. And lift him up. I got a remarkable letter and a remarkable email in the last few days. Let me tell you about both of them. I'm talking about remarkable. When I read it, I thought, this man is a Christian. He's got to be telling me the truth. So I'm going to accept what he said in his letter as the truth. The man who wrote the letter is from the United States. The woman who sent me the email is from Great Britain. I'm sure they don't know each other. I'm sure they have no connection. But the man who wrote the letter says, I go out on the street. He says, I go up to prostitutes and I pay them to come and listen to your message on hell. He said, they'll listen to that message on hell. And he said, I've watched them scream. I've watched them break down. I've watched them cry out to God. He said, I've watched them get saved. He pays them. Instead of selling themselves for sex, he buys them, he pays them to listen to the gospel. Woman in Great Britain. She sent me an email a few days ago. She said, I'm a social worker. I work with people. She says, I get these girls that are drug addicts, they're prostitutes. She says, I take them to the churches over here. She says, I take them to the churches and when we get in there, she says, it's, she said, it's just a, a rock session. It's just a, a, an empty, meaningless nothing. And she says, I got so sick of taking these girls to these, to these places. She says, I just keep them in the car now. And she says, I take my laptop and I log on to your message on hell. And I'll play that message on hell. And these girls do the same thing that they do in the States. They start crying out to God. They break down. They cry. And they get saved. She said, I thought you might want to know that. Just want to send it to you and let you know that God's using that. You know something? We got big, upstanding, clean, fine-looking, holier than thou, preachers and deacons and, and, and choir leaders and everything else in the church house, Sunday school teachers, greatest looking thing in the world. And yet they don't know anything about screaming and crying out to God in repentance to get right and get saved. Yet these prostitutes are getting saved. This girl in England. Yeah. Amen. Prostitutes. She says, when they hear this, they look at me with a look on their face like, where did this come from? They're totally foreign to it. It's, they've never heard it before. She said, so they stink. She said, these girls smell. She said, they come right off the street, right off the street. You know, they, I mean, they, they're on the bottom. But Christ died for them too. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm sure if the law might have a sting operation going on, <laughs> this fellow down here paying prostitutes, uh, he might be, he's, he's, you know, he's, buy, he's, buying the, he's buying the prostitute to give her the message. And he might, he might be hard pressed to make them believe it. But I guess all he'd have to do is take, her, take, him, take him back to some of the former prostitutes. Former, by the way, former. Yeah. Used to be. Such were some of you. Yeah. You get these girls saved, you get them off the street. Take, them, take, them, take, take the law back to some of them and they'll say, well, this guy is genuine. <laughs> I've never heard of this before, but this is real. Well, you know, nobody had to pay you to come in here today. One day you'll be standing next to people, folks, that were prostitutes. Some of them were murderers. Some of the lowest scum on the face of the earth. Yet they're born again. That's what it's about. That's what it's all about. And your life will change. If the Holy Ghost has ever truly moved into your soul, folks, a change is taking place that will not consummate until you're gone from here. Salvation is an immediate, finished thing. It can't change, but sanctification will. How many of you like to say to the Lord this morning, Lord? Well, some of that preacher said to me this morning, it struck home because you got me to a point, but I couldn't go any further. 
I was so embarrassed with what I used to be that I just no way I could confess that to you because I'm, I'm so ashamed of it. That's the devil working you over. I had a man at a radio station uh, 30 years ago. I was taking a tape over to the radio station. It was late one evening, I think. I took my tapes in there, and we took our tapes. We used to take them and put them up in a certain place. I took my tape in there, and he said, Preacher, can I talk to you for just a minute? And I said, Sure, you can. And he was the one on duty right then, the one running the radio station. He said, You know, I killed men back in World War II. He said, At night like this, it just eats my soul alive. He said, It eats me up. He said, he said Satan wires me out with it. He said, But I killed men in World War II. I said, Well, you were a warrior. They were trying to kill you, you trying to kill them, your soldier. You know, that's one thing. You're out there doing what your country called you to do, that's your duty. It's not a pretty thing and it's not something anybody wants. Nobody wants to kill somebody. That's as far and foreign to human nature as it can possibly be. But you're caught up in it and it happened to you. He said, Preacher, I prayed to God and I've confessed it and told the Lord I wanted him to forgive me. He said, But I just can't get any peace with it. I'll never forget that. I prayed with him. He said, I can't get peace with it. Here's what was happening to him. It was something too big in his life for him to believe that God could forgive him for it. He could believe that God would save him, but what he had done was so bad in his life that he could not get forgiveness. Let me tell you something. There is nothing, and I mean nothing, absolutely nothing, that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, will not cleanse. So I don't care how big it is. I don't care how much the devil's beating you to death with him. Maybe for 30 or 40 years, he'll, he'll forgive you. He'll cleanse you. And the forgiveness has already taken place. What you need to do is accept that forgiveness and receive it into your heart and say, Lord, I am forgiven, and I? Yes, you are. You're not forgiven because of what you do. You're forgiven because of what he's done. It's all built upon the finished work of Christ. Maybe that's where some of you are. You don't even recognize it. But you've come to like this. Far, you can't go any further against a brick wall. You need to receive what the Lord's done for you. Amen. I can't stress that enough. Father, thank you for your holy word, for the opportunity to stand one more time and proclaim it. I am blessed. I am blessed. I am blessed. What a privilege that you've given me to stand and proclaim your holy word. Bless your righteous name. Now, Father, may your word work in the hearts of the people who've heard it. May it produce fruit, Lord, for the glory of God. May you do what you want to do in this house today. It's in your hands now. The messenger's finished. It's the work now of the Almighty. In thy name we pray. Amen. Let's stand up and sing.